So in today's day and age with computers, you know, there are a lot of current threats and concerns out there. We've all heard about viruses and spyware and Trojans and worms and phishing. You know, those things are really all interchangeable terms. And what we're really focusing on today is how do we get them and really what boils down to the newest iteration of them, which is called ransomware. It's different forms of those things that are now not only just trying to kind of mess with your computer, but trying to actually uh, extort you and, and get a ransom paid for getting access to your data. So we're going to be talking about the, the current ways that we are seeing ransomware get out there, what it does, and then give you some tips on how to protect yourselves. So it is a constantly growing threat. You know, these malicious online pop-ups, they're more and more complicated, and, they're, and it's just tricky for people to figure out how to get around them. Um, we're often asked, why do we get these things? Why does it happen? Because we have antivirus software, we have these protections, we have firewalls. Well, what they're doing is they're tricking users into clicking on things, and it really lets them run as a normal old program. And they can get access and scramble anything that your users already have access to. We know your users need access to things like documents to be able to work. And because they have access, those ransomware uh, programs, viruses, and whatnot can get access to those files. So it is, a, it is a constantly growing threat. The most known one out there, which you may have heard of, is called CryptoLocker. Um, there are different iterations of it, whether it be Crypto Locker, Crypto Wall, there's Tesla Crypt, and, and there's even different versions of these. If you go online, you'll see about version 2.0, version 3.0. You know, there are unfortunately teams of hackers out there that are upgrading these things as aggressively or more so than even normal software programs. So whenever you hear crypto something, it's kind of a generic term nowadays for all these different things that can do it. Crypto Locker was the original. Again, what they usually do is they will encrypt your files, give you some kind of a ransom message such as the one you can see here, and asking you to send payment to get your files unlocked. Uh, usually they're encrypting them in a way where your files still look like they're all there, you just can't open them. Or, or maybe your management system gets hit, so you just start getting random errors with your management system. And, and that's what these things are all about. We are seeing, again, more and more evolutions of them. Here's another uh, one that we're seeing a lot lately, where it's just throwing a bunch of text on your desktop and kind of overlays your desktop with this kind of stuff. Um, they really are the same thing, and they're both new types of ransomware out there. So we're going to dive right in to talk about protecting yourself on the Internet. You know, that's probably the, the, the first line of defense, but also one of the trickier. So I'm going to give you lots of tips and tricks on what we can do. And it really all starts with securing your systems and making sure your users are acting securely. The first line of defense, and this one may seem a little redundant, but it's just making sure you have an acceptable use policy in your office. Um, we at Smart have one, and it's very simple, and you're free to, to use it if you want to. And it simply says that people are only allowed to do what pertains to their business function while, on, uh, while at work. You know, the, we, we found that over time, the more detailed you try to be with your policies, the more holes people can try to get into it. So you're only allowed to do what you need to do for your personal or your, your individual business function for accessing the web, for email, whatnot. So first line of defense is we've got to set the expectations for what people are allowed to do. We want to keep our web browsing safe. Um, some tips there are, are don't lower your web browser security settings. We find this is a common one if there is a user maybe having problems on a carrier website. The first thing they like to do is tell you to lower your security settings, and that's just not safe. Um, we're, we're happy to give you, you know, all those recommended settings some other time. There's lots and lots of details there, but when it comes to it, first of all, you know, you probably want to talk to your IT people instead of just calling a carrier about problems with that carrier's website because they should know pretty well on what settings are going to make that carrier's site work while still keeping you safe. You want to have a good internet monitoring and filtering system in place. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of discussion that we have with agencies on this, and a lot of people don't want to come off as big brother, and we, we understand that. But these systems are sophisticated nowadays where you can have them programmed to just block the bad stuff. 
um, but not really worry about the, the mid-level stuff of online shopping or whatnot. Um, so we, we really recommend that we get these in place. What we usually find is, is that uh, there's usually a few people that you didn't suspect are doing things after you put these in are really, and that there's probably a lot more going on than, than you really believe. So they're very effective nowadays, and they're sophisticated where they'll, they'll help you avoid the bad stuff and still allow that middle ground stuff if you so wish. We do still, of course, want to make sure you keep good antivirus protection and anti-malware protection. Um, you can find sometimes uh, programs that will work together to make up a good solution, but we feel the best thing to do is to get one program that will handle both. Because often these programs aren't worried about what the other one is doing, so if they're both trying to scan a file or block something, they can actually cause your, prob your, your system problems, slowness, instability, lockups, and whatnot. So the best thing to get is an antivirus and anti-malware program in one. And then this is the trickiest one, you know, but always be skeptical. If we can give everybody uh, one piece of advice, that, that would be a kind of our mantra, if you will. Um, gee, that pop-up doesn't look right, I'm not going to click on it. Gee, that email looks fishy, we're not going to click on it. So always be a skeptic. So some things to avoid online to ensure safe browsing are online chat. Now, that doesn't go for, you know, if you're online chat with a support vendor per se, but just general online chat. Uh, gambling sites and gaming sites. You know, these are, are usually one of the biggest um, harbingers of, of all that malware. They embed themselves in these site and just get you, sometimes without even clicking on something. Illegal download sites. You know, this is places you can try to go download free software. You know, we don't want people to do that at home to be safe, but especially not at work. And here's a tricky one, social networking sites. We know that Social media is all the marketing buzz nowadays, and we know that there's usually one or two people at the agencies that need social media, but everyone else probably doesn't. And the risk with social media is usually around what people are doing uh, from a personal standpoint. Facebook itself, Twitter, all those different, th those different sites, Instagram, they're not themselves unsafe for the content that's just there, but so much of the content there, it goes to other places. So when you're playing a game, when you're watching a video, when you're clicking on links for advertising, those are actually going to somewhere else. They're not actually a Facebook resource. And it's hard to tell when or when you're not actually still in Facebook or at one of these other places. So a sophisticated internet filtering system will let only the people you need do social media and then block everybody else from doing it at work. That was our recommendation. And, you know, when you're on a lot of these sites, you'll encounter a lot of pop-ups, a lot of advertisements. And one of the tricks is knowing what and what not to click on. So I'm going to give you some tips on what uh, to look out for. 80% um, of malware nowadays comes from legit websites, and that wa that's what makes it even more tricky. You can be on a legitimate website. We've even seen carriers or insurance agency resource websites that have these bad pop-ups embedded in them. So you've got to be careful even on sites that you do, tr uh, you do know and trust. And as a rule of thumb, never click on ads, period. Um, I know we're talking about pop-ups, but we recommend strongly just not clicking on ads. Uh, I know a lot of the marketing department people don't want me to say that, but... You know, truth be told, this is where a lot of things get you, is the advertisements. Just a matter of months ago, Yahoo published that one of their ad companies had over a billion ads in the last year that had viruses injected in them. A billion ads. And that was from Yahoo, a, a very, what you would think, reputable website. But they can't control what's in their ads. So if you do encounter some of these pop-ups, some things to watch out for are the programs that look like they're fake antivirus program, or that look like they're antivirus. It's important for everyone at each agency to know your antivirus program is Sophos antivirus, or yours is McAfee, or yours is Norton. Whatever you may have, make sure all your employees know. Because if an antivirus program ever pops up, and it's not the one that you've been told your agency uses, you want to avoid clicking on this. Uh, look at it like this is basically a big facade for a virus and anywhere you click will get you. 
and there's lots of ones out there. Here's one that make it look like it's a Windows program. It's got the Windows type logos on it, the Windows type buttons. You can see lots and lots of different examples. They all look like they're legit programs, but know what you've got for one. And number two, be aware that your antivirus program is not normally going to just pop up and start a scan. That's just not how they work. 99% um, of programs that I've seen out there and that we manage ourselves, they do their scans in the background. They will not pop up something big right in front of you during activity that they're going to be doing a scan. Here's a great one. It makes it look like they're the most helpful program in the world where they're going to scan you with all these different programs at once. And such a wonderful thing, even though we wish, really doesn't exist. This one, this is the maybe one of the trickier ones. Um, this one is called Microsoft Security Essentials. And it should be known that this is actually a real program. Microsoft does have a Security Essentials program. Um, but it's probably not going to be used at agencies. Um, it is a free install from Microsoft, but it's only free for personal use or businesses under 10 people. So chances are, if your agency is above 10 people, your IT person knows this and that you're not actually running Security Essentials. If you were to ever see this pop up, it's possible that it could be real, but it's also possible that it can't be. Again, that's why it's important to know what you're running, have your agency trained on what you have. Chances are you're actually not using Security Essentials at your office. And these hackers don't care about copyright infringement, about stealing the look of someone's programs. They're just trying to trick you. So what do we do with all these pop-ups? You know, I've mentioned that uh, they can be a kind of a big facade for an installer. So first, make sure your computers are patched up to date. Um, Microsoft, you may have heard, has something called Patch Tuesday, where the second Tuesday of each month is when the normal Microsoft updates are released. You want to make sure your IT company is getting you those patches shortly after Patch Tuesday. Um, we ourselves, for our customers, will evaluate those patches as quickly as possible upon release. We test them thoroughly on a test bed of systems, and then just a few days after Patch Tuesday, our customers are protected. We want to make sure, though, that there are no conflicts with the carrier sites. We've seen where Microsoft will release a glitchy patch, and we just give it a couple days of testing to make sure that those are vetted out. So make sure your computers are patched up shortly after Patch Tuesday, that second Tuesday of the month. Again, don't lower your web browser security settings. Uh, we want to make sure that they're, they're kept at medium high or higher and with protected mode running as needed. And educate your users what to look out for as far as these pop-ups go. If they do receive one, you don't want to click the X in the top right to close it. You don't want to click close. You don't want to click cancel. Again, these programs are a big facade. Look at it like they're uh, a skin over a big install this virus button. So the safe way to get rid of it is by pressing Alt and the F4 key on your keyboard. That's actually a Windows shortcut that says close the program in front of me. If you've got five pop-ups, you might hold the Alt key and click F4 five times. Um, if they're not going away, you'll want to just simply turn your computer off and call your IT company. And again, reminder is, is install a web filtering device on your network. Not only can they keep people away from the tricky sites, but they can also be tuned to block advertisements. We do that for our customers to make sure that the bad ads are not getting through too. So lots to think about as far as protecting yourself on the internet. And email security is just as big of a deal as internet protection. Uh, we see about uh, uh, you know three quarters to about 90% of stuff coming from um, uh, email. And of that, 89% come from spam emails. Now, spam is one of those tricky birds where spam is different for everyone. So I'm going to help you identify what some of these tricky spams are as well, just like we did pop-ups. So here's one. I've received this myself. Um, Funny as it was, I received this before I had an American Express card. So, you know, that's a dead giveaway for me of, wait a minute, I don't have an American Express. I didn't update my email address. But as you can see, these spammers are just as tricky as those hackers trying to make those pop-ups. They will go out to websites. They will steal the look and feel of, the, of those sites. They'll copy the logos. They'll even mask real web addresses.
So here's an example of, uh, of an email that came from American Express. You'll see here that when I hover over that link that says, please click here to review your payment details, we get a little uh, a pop-up that tells us what website it's actually going to be taking us to. And in this case, even though it looks like it's an American Express, they're trying to take us to some Dropbox file. And I can say without any reasonable doubt that that's not American Express for one, and that Dropbox stuff is probably not friendly. So we want to be careful about uh, uh, clicking on any link in an email. It's clicking on things in the email that are going to get you, not just opening the email itself. Uh, here's another interesting set. We see these a lot. Uh, UPS shipping notifications. So if you look at the top, you can see that, that very oddly formatted address, that it's someone on behalf of UPS shipments, and that's not how UPS works. Um, it's not very often that people actually have UPS delivery confirmations, even though it is something that you can do nowadays. Um, but again, this is a case where you'll hover over those links, even though they look like they're pointing to UPS. It's a very easy programming trick to make a link look like something else. You want to hover over those links and make sure they're real before you click them. But just think, did you actually order something? Um, maybe you're like me where you shop a lot online and once in a while you forget you ordered something from Amazon. But uh, always check those links and make sure they're real before you click. Uh, here's an interesting one. Um, we want to uh, click here to get some uh, inexpensive dog food for our cute little pet guy here. But what you'll see in this email is wherever I moved my mouse on this one, it was trying to take me to the link of exclusivepromos.net slash a bunch of stuff. It's common for spammers to make an email that's actually, again, just kind of like a big click me button. Even though it says click here, it doesn't matter where you click, including down at the bottom where it says click here to unsubscribe. So if you ever see an email where no matter where you put your mouse, it looks like a pointer and wants to take you to a link, that's a dead giveaway that that's probably going to take you to a bad place. So here's another one. Um, again, just a, a, a risky looking link that it's going to take us to. This one in particular says something at the end of .php. You know, that's just a kind of a website file. But what that is, is that's usually code for a website that's going to run some kind of scripts on you. So another giveaway of links you want to watch out for. I would not click on this link. If you had opened the email, I would delete it right away. Um, very tricky emails, and as you can see, this one actually came in to us. Uh, it's common that we're now seeing uh, spammers trying to get you to click on bad links by masking them as a voicemail. And the trend we've seen this in particular is they will usually only send between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. Generally, that's when we're at lunch, right? So they're trying to make it think that we missed a voicemail while we were at lunch. But again, this is not what our voicemail system notifications look like. Make sure your users understand what your notifications look like for voicemail to email. And then same goes for fax to email. Um, this looks kind of similar to what our fax to email reports look like, but not exactly. Um, also, our fax to email reports don't at the bottom have a link that says to download, click here. So this is a fake spam, probably with a virus, trying to mask like a legit fax report. So important to train your users on what your notifications are really going to look like and give people that assurance that if you're going to make changes to your system, you'll let them know ahead of time. We've seen this one very often as well. Um, copies of resume files and resumes particularly coming over with zip files. Um, so for starters, if you're not a person at the office that is responsible for hiring, chances are you getting this as a spam and that's a red flag to start. But people also shouldn't be sending their resumes as zip files. It's most common to make them PDFs or once in a while Word docs. I would never open a zip file that said it was a resume or any zip file for that matter from someone that I wasn't expecting what it was. So there's lots of examples for what you can avoid as far as those tricky uh, uh, spam emails. I'm going to give you some more quick email tips. Number one is do not unsubscribe from any spam emails or reply to them. Most of them have a click here to unsubscribe. Now, this may not necessarily go for like a company uh, weekly bulletin. Th those are probably going to be safe to unsubscribe from. Although I wouldn't recommend that either. I would add them to my block list if you will want them. 
clicking unsubscribe or replying to these is going to do pretty much one thing. It's going to put you on their list of live addresses. They're not only going to keep sending to you, but they're then going to share you with other lists knowing that you're a live person. Because say 10 people at the agency got the same spam, chances are the, the spammer sent 10,000 and just happened to get a couple that were matching addresses. Make sure your email system is blocking executable and script type files. So you don't want to have executables or VB script or com or bat. Your IT people should uh, know what these are and make sure that they're blocking executables. Here's one that comes with a, a little bit of uh, argument at times of blocking zip files. Um, we know there are legitimate places that do send zip files. But that is only yeah, maybe 10% of what we see as far as zip files being delivered. It's probably the most common delivery method for spam now just because people are occasionally used to getting zip files in the, for real work. As you saw, that last example was a fake virus that was in a zip file saying it was a resume. So most email filtering systems do have the ability to block zip files and you can narrow it down that if you have one or two people working with a certain carrier that they have to receive them, that you can make it just so those people are in those cases can receive and block zip files for others. That would be our recommendation. Also block files with macros. Um, an example that I didn't show but that we're commonly seeing now is the fake resume or even fake invoices that are coming across with Word docs or Excel files. And we know from doing our normal work with our management systems that it's common that we'll open up a Word file or, or a Excel file or PowerPoint access and whatnot. And we'll be prompted that some content wants to run. Well, that's a macro that's going to run a script. And that very well could be a virus. We're seeing that more commonly. So we are doing that for our customers now. We're blocking macros and emails, and we recommend that everyone does that. A tip in Outlook itself is we recommend strongly that you turn off what's called your reading pain. We know a lot of people love that. It's where your bottom half or your bottom right of your Outlook will actually show the message that you've got highlighted without you having to double click it. But the risk there is, is you've already opened that email without double clicking it. So it's just that much easier to click on a link or an attachment accidentally in an email that you didn't intend to open. So our strong recommendation for best security is to turn off your reading pain. Want to go into mobile security a bit. Um, I would say that 90% of people at agencies nowadays that we see have some kind of a mobile device, whether it be a personal or a company provided device uh, used for work. So it's a very, very big deal. And unfortunately, a study by the Gartner Group in 2015 shows that malware on Android itself is up 400%. This is far outpacing the growth of malware on Macs or on PCs. That Android now is the biggest target by far for malware. So how do you avoid it? We want to make sure that we've got our devices configured securely for starters, including a password. Make sure you have your device password protected. Always make sure you're doing your updates on devices. Um, most devices, if you do have a limited data plan, have the ability to have updates go automatically either when you're uh, charging or when you're on Wi-Fi only. We would recommend you at least do those if you're worried about your data plan and don't want it to update all the time during the day. But make sure all your, your uh, apps and the device itself are always up to date. They usually include security devices with every update as well. There are lots of antivirus solutions available for mobile platforms. Um, most of them are going to function in the manner where they're just looking for known bad programs. But a lot of them will also scan for programs that maybe have access to things that you didn't intend them to have access to. That's one of the more common ways that they're getting access to your stuff where they're virus-like because they're able to take your data and send it to others. Consider doing encryption on your device. Uh, what this will do is if your device is lost, then other people can't get things off of it. Um, also, some programs won't be able to do what they're trying to do if you have encrypted your device. And then a general tip 
is always make sure you dispose of your device properly. I would never get rid of a phone before going through a factory wipe and reset process on it first. And then make sure you're taking it to a place that's going to dispose of it properly, not just throwing it in the dumpster, especially behind a building. Uh, that's going to be the first target where if somebody's trying to get you, they're going to look in the dumpster of somebody that they want to get. And then lastly, develop usage guidelines. Uh, we've heard many times at agencies, oh, we're not worried about mobile. We know who has access. And then we can run a report on the mail system to see who really has access. And we're often found that people are surprised. When one person has access, they might tell another person how to get in. And that might person might tell another person. You might not realize that everyone in your office has now worked stuff on their mobile device without your knowledge. So we recommend you set up guidelines just like you do for acceptable use policies for internet and email. Choose your apps wisely. Um, this goes more for the Android world than iPhone. You know, don't download anything that claims to unlock a paid app for free. Um, don't rely on app reviews also. I found an interesting article just a week ago that there are more than 400 million fake ads created by Chinese companies per year on the Android App Store. 400 million fake ads. Always look at an app's requirements before you install it too and see if it's asking for too much. I'll give you a good example of that here. You know, I'm trying to install IMDB and you, you just click OK and accept real quick. But if you take a minute to read and look at those, you might find yourself second guessing, gee, do I really want to do this? Does this app really need permission to make phone calls without my knowledge, to send texts without my knowledge? to modify and delete contents on your memory cards. This is where encryption will help. It'll stop those from doing it. Can it read my contacts? Can it update my contacts, read my logs, use my GPS? And the scary one is use my credentials. If an app ever asks for that, that basically means you're giving it permission to get the passwords from your other apps. Folks, I've literally seen a flashlight program <laughs> looking for all this information. That is the number one sign that this program is probably not a legit program, even though it might be a working flashlight, it's actually probably a malware program. So what else can we do? We've, we've gone over some specific things. Let's talk a few more. Be safe with Wi-Fi. Don't connect to Wi-Fi if you don't trust it. Um, I would also not let outside people come into your office and connect to your own Wi-Fi. Um, if you have a business class Wi-Fi in your office, chances are it's got a guest wireless setup as well as a private wireless for your own internal use. So if you don't have a business class Wi-Fi in your agency, that's number one safety uh, a measure that you can take by putting in a new higher class Wi-Fi device. Here's a list of the top 10 worst passwords. I always like to throw this out. Um, hopefully nobody is seeing your password on this list. If you are, I recommend right after the webinar, please go change it. And here are some tips for strong passwords. Um, if you uh, hadn't heard what happened with Home Depot and Target in the last couple of years with their big hacks that got millions of people's records stolen, they were all because people didn't have complex passwords. So we definitely recommend that you get complex passwords on your networks. I'll leave the guidelines up here for a second. Again, we are going to be posting this web uh, this webinar online on YouTube shortly following, so you can always go back and, and get these out of there as well. But please, I encourage everyone to set yourself strong passwords. With the last point being particularly important, make sure your passwords are set to change every so on. We recommend uh, 60 to 90 days. Make sure your system updates and patches are done. I know I mentioned this earlier, but I just want to reiterate it. Updates and patches are very, very important. Those are the, the first line of defense for stopping things getting into your computer. And lastly, what do we do if we do get infected? Unfortunately, it's probably going to happen. A lot of those links are tricky. So if you do get infected, first, don't pay the ransom. It's kind of like one of those urban those myths. Everybody know a guy who knew a guy who heard of a guy who paid it and got his files back, but we've never actually seen it happen. So don't pay the ransom if you do get it. First step after realizing you've gotten infected is to see what got infected. That's important because your next line of def your next step is going to be restoring from a backup. In almost no cases we've seen you can get your files back. So restoring from a backup is important. 
if you're running some kind of a virtualized uh, a server, you can probably get back from snapshots. You know, we've got the ability to get our cloud customers back or our virtual customers back if need be, if something bad were to happen in about 15 minutes. And actually, as of last week, I do have some exciting news. I mentioned there are lots of different versions of these crypto programs. There is now a release of a fix for the Tesla crypt. Uh, believe it or not, uh, one of the antivirus companies just literally asked the virus creator, hey, can we have a copy of the encryption key? And they said, sure, nobody's ever asked. Here you go. And they made a fix. So it's hard to tell sometime if you do get these bad things, what version you have. So look to see if, if it might be Tesla Crypt, have your IT company. If you do get infected, try to run the fix. That is a little glimmer of hope now to maybe get your files back. So hopefully you don't have that um, because you've got everyone trained of what to look out for. Um, if you do have any questions or you do have any issues, here's our contact information. You can email us, visit our website, and, and submit a contact form.